Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. My name is Matt Binder. I'm the Adele Program Coordinator here at the library. Um, thank you for coming out for the program Wildlife in Our Backyards. This program was made possible through partnerships with the Arlington Heights Police Department as well as the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Tonight there will be three speakers, our local experts, Vicki Geyer, Animal Warden for the AHPD, Public Services Officer Robert Koska, and our special guest expert, Michelle Motlowitz, Nature Center Director at River Trails Nature Center with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. A final reminder, please look for upcoming library programs and events in our newsletter and on our website, ahml.info. Our upcoming summer newsletter should arrive in homes before the end of May. We have a lot of great family, kids, teen, adult, and senior programs coming up for everyone to enjoy. Now, I would like to welcome to the stage Vicki Geyer, Animal Warden for the Arlington Heights Police Department. Hello, as he said, my name is Vicki Geyer. I am the Animal Welfare Officer for the Police Department. I've been doing this for approximately 29 years, and I have learned a lot through on the job training, just dealing with wildlife, plus a lot of classes that we do have to take. Now, what we're gonna go over between myself and Bob are things that we can and cannot do for the public when it comes to wildlife. The major portion of our job is to educate the public, how to live in harmony with the wildlife, how to keep them from taking over under your deck or your porch, and things that you can do that will keep them from wanting to stick around in your yard if you don't want them there. We do live trap, as you can see there's live traps down here, but the only reason we use those is if, say, a squirrel gets into your living, like your living room, uh, your bedroom, your basement, then we will set a trap for that animal. And when we do trap it, it goes outside and is released right into your yard because he got in there by mistake. He's not going to want to go back there if he doesn't have to. He wants to get back out there where he's used to everything. Um, we don't get raccoons out of chimneys. We will tell you how you can keep them from getting into your chimneys, but we're not gonna go up on a roof. We're not going to go up into an attic if a raccoon gets in your attic and trap them. That entails a lot of different things. You have to find out where they're getting in. You have to go up in the attic to set the trap so that you get that particular animal. Otherwise, you're just gonna get anyone that's walking by or climbing on your roof. You probably have more animals on your roof than you know about. If you look in the snow time, you know, when it snows in the winter, if you look up on your roof, you'll probably see some kind of footprints on your roof, more often than not, whether it be a squirrel or a raccoon. So we can give you ideas. We can let you know that we can't do that, but if you hire a private agency, they can go, they can do it. They can check out your roof. Make sure that you're not going to continue to have a problem once this animal leaves. So they, they're very helpful. They're not cheap, but they do a really good job, things that we cannot do. Um, say you've got a skunk or a possum that gets in your garage by mistake because the kids had the bikes out late. It's the summer. You didn't close your garage door before the sun went down and they got in there. Well, all you have to do is open your garage door. Wait for them to go out. Don't sit there, because they're not gonna wanna be by you if you're sitting there watching them in a lawn chair. You kinda leave them alone, let them get out the way they came in. They're just curious. They like to walk the perimeters of your home. So if you leave something open, they're gonna go right around the corner and right into an open door. Um, we are not gonna trap animals because they're in your yard or living under your deck. We don't have that kind of a license to do such a thing. What we trap is gonna be something we can release back into the same area he came from or something that is really sick. Maybe a raccoon with distemper that's in your yard walking around in circles and it's suffering, it's sick. It's gonna pass it on to other animals too. So we'll take care of those. Skunks that fall in your window well we will take care of those too. But then we'll let you know 
that you really, really should have window well covers because that's gonna prevent them from going in there. So there's a lot of things that we can prevent from happening that we're gonna live in harmony more likely with the animal rather than, you know, oh, that darn skunk, he's walking around in my backyard and he's sprayed and it stinks. Well, you feed the birds, the birds have, you know, the, the seed on the ground, it starts to grow, the skunks like it, the grubs in your yard, all different kind of things. We can tell you, treat your yard for grubs. Don't feed the birds in the summer. Birds don't need a supplemental food in the summer, only in the winter, because then they can't find the food they need. There's all different kinds of things that we can do for you. Um, we get a lot of calls this time of year for coyote. Coyote limping, you know, coyote running down the street. You have to remember, they're very similar to a dog. They like to lay out in the sunshine. They like to roll in the grass. They like the warm mulch. They're gonna be out there, but they're more afraid of us than we are of them. So we'll tell people, we keep a log that says where they've been, you know, seen. Um, we try to keep track of that because it's, it's good to know these things. They're everywhere. They're in the city of Chicago. We have to learn to live with all this wildlife and not just think they need to be removed because you know, they don't belong here. They do, and they're fun to watch. You can watch these animals, just sit back and watch them. So when you look at things a little differently, it's more enjoyable to have these animals around. And we are here to educate you, to let you know how you can prevent things from happening that shouldn't be happening, and how to enjoy the wildlife that we have in our town. That's about all I have to say. Now we'll have Bob Koska, the public service officer, come up. Thank you, Vicki. How is everybody? Good. All good? Excellent. A uh, couple different things that I was going to share. Obviously, Vicki touched on a number of different things that are important to know. And what we hope to do tonight is to blend a little bit of education with expectation of service. Uh, the one thing that uh, Vicki did um, mention a couple times is resource providing. As a number of you have come in already, I noticed that you stopped at our table, and I'm glad you did. Um, one of the um, examples of a handout that I have available here is the Animal Control Resource Guide. Did anybody see that? Did everybody grab that? Did everybody grab a pen? Because I'm going to expect you to take some notes. And this is the time to take some notes. This is actually the same form that we provide to our probationary officers in training. This is the same guidance form that we provide to officers that respond to the same calls that Vicki and I do. Just so you understand, we're it for this entire town. Vicki and I are your animal control staff. We don't always work. We're not always available. Sometimes police officers will have to go and they're gonna provide you a general overview of the same kind of information that we're sharing tonight. The reason this form is important is because it touches on a lot of the resourcing, guidance forms, um, and uh, information sharing through Google and otherwise um, that's important to solve some of the neighborhood and backyard problems, okay? So the first thing you're gonna see here is kind of an overview of what the village website provides. Again, a valuable resource that not everybody always refers to. Just add animal control to the search engine on vah.com and you're gonna get the basic type of information um, sharing that you have on this forum. So a lot of it's gonna be uh, some of the resource providers that we depend upon. It's going to be a combination of information through the Department of Natural Resources, Flint Creek Nature Center and Animal Rehab. Some of these names I hope are gonna sound familiar to you. This is where you have to take your pen out because I want you to circle a lot of these on that form. First of all, Flint Creek has a really uh, real informative, user-friendly brand of website. And it touches on every possible brand of um, nuisance or wildlife problem you could imagine in your yard. They talk about how to deal with them. They talk about how to defend against them. Um, and they can provide some type of rehabilitative services. 
Additionally, we're going to have information that's available through other resources like the Humane Society. They can give you general information on coyote hazing. I'm betting that a lot of you are power walkers and none of you probably have pets. A lot of you probably take advantage of the spring seasons, summer seasons, and you're out walking. There's a chance you might encounter some of these animals. I want you to think about defending yourself against some of, the, some of nature's beasts like you would a mugger. I want you to think about having a flashlight in your hand. I want you to think about maybe carrying a whistle. Has anybody ever been to a, like a high school basketball or football game and somebody in the top row of the bleachers has an air horn? They make those in compact sizes. It's a good thing to pack that. It's a good thing to have um, a plan. A plan to defend yourself against some type of animal encounter. Making yourself big, waving your arms, making a lot of noise, using a whistle, maybe keeping some rocks in your pocket. Nothing wrong with slinging some rocks at an animal that might be too used to people and that you might encounter, okay? WikiHow. I bet a lot of you are familiar with the website. Very user-friendly. WikiHow to do everything. You could do everything from baking a better pie to learning how to tile your bathroom. But we recommend it as a Google internet resource site for how to repel animals. Wiki how to repel a skunk. Wiki how to repel a possum. A number of different suggestions for at-home brands of remedies where you possibly don't have to go to the expense of any kind of um, abatement service. Things that you can concoct, things that you can blend. Things that you can do with um, baking extracts or uh, an ammonia-soaked rag. Something that you can try to use to repel animals from your home, from your deck, from underneath your shed slab. Not every one of these remedies is going to be a silver bullet. It's entirely possible that you have to do a number of things. It's entirely possible that you have to invest a little bit of energy into securing your yard. But being careful about it, being smart about it, and being wary about the, um, the situations and utilizing your resourcing. Next best site, wiki.easyvid.com. Again, it's on the form. You can make a note of it if you'd like. wiki.easvid.com. Plug in Scarecrow water sprinkler into the search engine of that website you're going to get a really entertaining five-minute product review of different types of motion-activated sprinkler heads. Now, of course, we all understand that we live in and around Arlington Heights. And you never know at a moment's notice when the temperature is going to drop and we could face a blizzard. <laughs> Some of these remedies, unfortunately this one in particular, might be seasonally driven. So you can't use a hose in your yard for maybe two or three months out of the year. But there is probably no more effective animal repellent than a sprinkler head and just spraying water. Okay. Again, knowing your resources, knowing how to um, search and defend yourself. Be careful with your animal feeding. Be careful about providing habitat. Okay. One other thing, and I know I'm going to probably get some long faces. You have to call 911 for service. You just have to. As a matter of fact, if you pay attention to our squad cars, the next one, pa one passes you, um, it says call 911. It doesn't say emergency 911. So if you have a barking dog, if you have a large, uh, a loud garbage truck, or if you have a nuisance animal in your backyard, the call has to go to 911. So many times, people will think that they're doing the right thing by calling the service number for the police department. It doesn't help you. All calls for service from the police department have to go to 911. It's entirely possible that you could call the service number thinking you're absolutely positively doing the right thing. I don't want to overburden emergency services. This is not an emergency. Trust me. They've already made the decision for you. If, for example, you were to call the service number um, and you were to report to one of our desk civilian staff, I have an injured skunk in my yard. 
they're going to instantly transfer you to 911. You've delayed the response, you delayed the likelihood that maybe the animal could escape. Our police officers are um, entrusted to provide you the same services we do. Because what did I say when I let off my discussion? Vicki and I don't work every single day, okay? And the village is big on providing the services that you expect every single day. So in order to get them, you have to call 911. And that's why it's highlighted in the slide, okay? Knowing your resources, knowing what you can do, knowing what sometimes what you can do inexpensively to defend yourself. You can keep the most pristine, well-manicured yard. And invariably, you can go two or three doors, east, west, north, or south, and you're gonna find an avid bird feeder. Somebody who just supports the birds. There's nothing wrong with that, it's a great hobby. They could bird seed feed, they could um, bread feed, they could do so many things. And that kind of feeding, because we know the habits of birds, and we definitely know the habits of squirrels, makes a mess. And then instantly, we'll draw other types of animals to that yard. Well, they're gonna pilgrim their way right through your yard to get to that yard. And in our situation, when they draw smaller animals, you're also gonna draw larger animals. And that's where the coyotes come in. And I'll bet there's a few coyote questions in the room, okay? Don't spring them on me yet, but save them, because we're really, really excited to hear from Michelle Motlowitz. Are you excited to hear from Michelle Motlowitz? Yes. Okay, that was a lukewarm brand of applause. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing that, you know, Michelle, um, she came a long way. So maybe a louder brand of like applause. <laughs> Wow, well, Michelle, you know what? Um, I didn't get that kind of applause. That's crazy. No, stop. The speaker I'm looking forward immensely to hear from, and I know the speaker that you came to hear, uh, the executive director of the River Trails Nature Center, Michelle Motlowitz. Okay, so just so you know, I um, need to use a stool. <laughs> and I'm not accustomed to just standing still in one spot, so this could be a little stiff. Sorry. Let's see how this goes. Goodness. <sighs> wow. Okay. How's this for the microphone? Good? Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me here again this year. Again, my name is Michelle Motlowitz. I am the director at River Trail Nature Center. I'm actually a naturalist. Um, I'm gonna put some information here on the screen. I am first and foremost a naturalist with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. I have worked for the Forest Preserves. I'm in my 27th year. I also have worked for the US Forest Service in Colorado for Pike National Forest. Um, I started out as an intern and I've worked my way up through all of the positions to the Nature Center director. And I'm not a wildlife biologist, but part of my job is to learn from our wildlife biologists and to learn what they have studied and researched and then we use that for education. I'm going to start out with showing you a little bit about Cook County. I show you this information because we live in an incredibly diverse, large community. And we have wonderful wildlife and wildlife resources and ecology in our area. And I truly believe that none of us want to see these pristine habitats go away. Along with these habitats come a variety of different plant and animal species. But it's important to understand just how large Cook County is and just how much of Cook County is covered in forest preserves. It's historic. Cook County Forest Preserves are over 100 years old. The early commissioners tried 
for several years, I believe it was 12 years, to get the Forest Preserve Act to um, be enacted in Illinois. This kind of forethought by our early commissioners in the Cook County and Chicagoland region was um, unmatched for anywhere else. We were creating the forest preserves at the same time that the US Forest Service was being created. We have 70,000 acres in Cook County. That's one out of every 11 acres is Forest Preserve property in Cook County. We are the second largest county population to Los Angeles. We are an enormous area, and to have this much is amazing. So on to the Forest Preserves. As I said, 70,000 acres. And when you think about that, that does not include all of the other municipalities within Cook County that now have park district lands. It also doesn't include all of the other counties surrounding Cook County that followed suit and created their own conservation districts and forest preserve districts. We have a wealth of open land for recreation, for habitat, for diversity in our region. And regularly we have, um, at the forest preserves, we are asked how, we c how other communities around the country, and we have people from other countries coming to see how we manage the land. People want to know, how did we gain all of this land? Of course, it's almost impossible to do this nowadays at the price of the land. So with all of this land being held for so long, I mean, not all of the land has been held for over 100 years, but throughout the time that we have had the forest preserves, we have continued to um, purchase land and hold land and manage the land. So here's a very small list of animals that the wildlife biologists in the forest preserves of Cook County research and work with yearly. This is extensive. They are doing some of the top research in learning how disease transmits from animals to people. They are doing some of the top research on urban animals in you know, people's backyards. So this is the information that I'm gonna to present to you tonight, or at least some of it. Lastly, this is my last slide, I believe, with um, words. And uh, this is the animals that have been extirpated from Cook County. Extirpated means they are extinct in our region, but they are not extinct in the world. So for example, wolf. Now we do have wolves that come through. They are moving um, from different regions, usually North or South Dakota. We know this because we keep blood samples. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in a bit. Uh, but the biologist can take a blood sample and see where that wolf, cougar, black bear is from. These are the animals that are not found in Cook County in breeding pairs. That's what's important when we're talking about animals and uh, whether they live here. If one is here by chance, they're still extirpated. They're not living here and breeding. Um, elk, there is um, a pen of elk in, in um, Elk Grove Village. Those are elk that we have, they're not wild. They are elk that we raise in the forest preserves um, for Elk Grove Village. This is just a map of the Forest Preserve holdings on the Cook County map. And you can see that there is um, a very, there's a very purposeful um, arrangement. What's in the center there? Chicago. City of Chicago. So 
The city of Chicago is included in the forest preserves of Cook County, but we have the tiniest amount of land in the city of Chicago. Most of the forest preserves is located around the city. And you'll also notice that the majority of the forest preserves fall near some water. Chicago River, Skokie Lagoons, Des Plaines River, in the Palos area, those are all the sloughs. That's just very common. So now on to the program at hand. What is in your backyard? I'm sure you all can tell me what's in your backyard, but I'm gonna take a few guesses. Starting with our only, our only marsupial found in North America. Um, opossum are harmless. I know they don't look harmless, but they are harmless. They are um, an active participant in most people's yards. Sometimes people find them in their garages. I know that Vicki talked about if you leave your garage open, you might find that an animal uh, wanders its way in. This is generally what happens. And this is gonna be a theme throughout my presentation. Keeping doors and garages open, bird feeding, um, having, having any kind of a water issue in your house and having weakened structure in your house. These are all ways that animals find their way in. And there are a variety of other things that we do in our yards that can attract um, animals into our yard. And personally, remember I am a naturalist. Personally, I think it's great to have animals in our backyards. Um, whether they're bothering you is another story, but having those animals means that you've got great habitat in some way, or it may mean something else. We'll find out. So I always like to show a slide with the babies because people have a different idea when they see the babies. Okay, so when I said opossums are the only marsupial in North America, who can tell me what is its closest relative? Kangaroo. Kangaroo, good job. So a marsupial means that it carries its young in a pouch. It carries its young for a long time. Something I want you to know about opossums, and by the way, some people call them possums. You'll see that in my next slide. Is that they're actually very beneficial. They eat a lot of ticks. They eat a lot of insects. They really are not in your yard to bother you. And this is another theme of the program. Animals in our backyards are not consciously there to scare you and your family or to bother you. They're there for a reason. Something has brought them there. What has brought them there? Hopefully we can figure out whether it's positive or whether it's something that needs to be fixed. Okay, we're gonna move on. Striped skunk. Striped skunk gets a really bad rap. <laughs> Most people don't think so, uh, but I do. So the striped skunk. Striped skunk looks nothing like any other animal in our habitat, in our region. It is bold, it is bright, it is out loud letting you know that it's there. There's a reason for that because they've adapted very well with a protection. They don't need to camouflage themselves. Instead, they have a way of letting you know when they're afraid. Now, skunks will sometimes give you an indication that they are afraid ahead of time. I thought I had that in my slideshow, but I guess I don't. They will sometimes do a handstand. Has anybody ever seen a skunk do a handstand? They actually do that. Yes, our animal control officers have seen that. <laughs> um, they will stump, sometimes stomp on the ground with their front paws. Um, it's when they're surprised 
that they are usually the most aggressive. I'll tell you another time when they're very aggressive. In the fall, when they're young, are starting to leave, and they're not as confident. And the young can spray a little bit more often without being provoked as much, okay? So what attracts skunk into our yards? Well, this is one of those times where I'm gonna tell you, start looking at your own yard. They love, they're really an insectivore, they love grubs. If your yard is filled with grubs, that is something that they're attracted to. So the first, the picture on the left is what a yard looks like or what lawn might look like with uh, grubs, uh, patches of dead grass in the middle. And the picture on the right are some of the small holes that the skunks will make. If you wake up in the morning and you're finding a bunch of small holes, I have plenty of other slides that have holes in them, so that might not be what it is, but if you have small holes like this and it's just a top layer of grass, of sod, might be grubs and it might be skunks. And the best way to fix that is to treat your lawn for the grubs. Remember, I told you there would be a theme on bird feeding. We've all said it. Now, by no means am I telling anybody not to feed the birds. But if you are having trouble with an animal that is visiting your yard that you are not interested in having in your backyard, the first thing to look at is what is attracting them. And bird feeders are an attractant for, to a variety of animals. And you'll see this throughout. Um, I have this exact ground feeder. I have three of them at the Nature Center. And what happens at night? A lot of other things eat off of those um, feeders. It does happen. Those are the babies, by the way. Shrews. I bet you didn't know that you were gonna learn about shrews today. Shrews are small insectivores again. They look like rodents. They're not. They eat a lot of small, sluggy, buggy insects and things in the yard. Um, but they do look like a rodent. They might be in your yard. Again, if you have areas of your yard where you are, for whatever reason, not keeping it manicured or well manicured or where water is building up and it's attracting a lot of um, slugs and insects. If you have uh, plants in your yard that are covered in slugs or a variety of other things, you might be attracting other animals into the yard. The reason I'm showing you these two animals is because they're not rodents. They're actually wonderful animals in our ecosystem. And depending on where you live and depending on what your backyard and your yard um, is adjacent to, you might have these. I accidentally snap trapped one of these in my, in my garage one time when I was snap trapping um, some mice. So they're out there. Moles. People forget about these. If you see that kind of, um, and this happens especially if you're near a golf course, um, where there's a lot of land, moles make these large tunnels. Your entire yard could end up being tunneled by moles. I would say if you have a mole in your yard, that's when an animal removal company is important. Because um, again, the only thing by law you're allowed to do if you trap an animal is to re-release it on your own property. If you want to get rid of it, you need to hire a removal company who has the permits to then release it, okay? These aren't the most common, but I did want to mention them. I'm going in order for um, insectivores. I want to talk a little bit about bats. We have more bats than just the species I've put up on the screen. We have a variety of different bats in Cook County. 
Bats are an incredibly important part of our forest habitat and our, our river habitat. The ecology, though, for bats is pretty dismal. Red bats in particular, they hibernate underneath the bark of the trees. So with so many people taking trees down when they die, which of course is important for safety, um, maybe people take them down for aesthetics, but for safety, it's important to take those trees down. They're losing a lot of their habitat. We also have a problem with all the spraying of the mosquitoes and a variety of other problems. They also have their own issues, including the fungus, the white nose fungus that is um, affecting the colony bats, like the little brown bats. And, um, and they also are one of our rabies vector species in Illinois. They're one of two species that rabies is more common in. Striped skunk is the other one. So skunk and, and some bats um, are two of our species or animal species that are, have a, more, a higher likelihood of having rabies. It doesn't mean they have them, it's just a higher likelihood. Um, bats in the yard are really very good. They eat a tremendous number of moths, mosquitoes, and other insects at night. Having bats in your house is another story. <laughs> Any bat found in somebody's house and removed will be euthanized. It is state law because of that, um, because they are an, a rabies vector species. Same with the skunk, I did forget to mention that. All skunks that are removed are euthanized. They are not rehabbed and released. Okay, we can take questions in a little bit. So now we're getting to one of my nemesis animals. Um, like I said, 27 years I've worked for the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Most of that time I've been at River Trail. I, have, I was also director at Trailside, and I have also worked at Crabtree Nature Center in Barrington. Um, rabbits, from March, through November, we may get something like 300 calls a week about the bunnies, the baby rabbits in people's yards. We don't get calls as much about the rabbits, although when people do call about rabbits, they want to know how to stop them from eating all of their, um, their plants. But what's interesting is that when people call about the bunnies, Anybody know what they might be calling about when they call about bunnies? What their question is? What was that? A nest. A nest? And do they want to keep the nest? Yes, most people want to save the bunnies in their yard. They don't want the rabbits, but they want the bunnies. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They, I get all of these calls about bunny nests in the yard. The Forest Preserves does have a policy of, of letting nature take its course when, when possible. Uh, we recognize and we realize that in people's yards, it, it, there is a, a certain, um, people don't want to see nature always happen in their yard. Um, pred you know, predation and a variety of other things that happen to animals. But when possible, we do recognize and we do recommend that you leave the rabbits alone. So I might recommend if somebody has a dog and they don't want to let their dog out in the yard because of the bunnies, because the dogs have found the nest, here's a nest of bunnies, um, I will recommend getting a laundry hamper and some camping stakes, tent stakes, put the laundry basket over the nest during the day and at night when you go to bed pull it up so that mom can get back to those bunnies. A lot of people feel that the babies are abandoned. And the reason they feel that the baby is abandoned is because they, just like this, they don't see the mother rabbit. Well, mom isn't with the rabbits in the middle of the day. Mom needs to eat herself so that she can have enough energy to make mother's milk and feed those babies. So she's gone. 
She also doesn't want to be around so that hawks and other animals can eye spy those babies and where she's put them. Sometimes the nests are covered up and you can barely see them. All sorts of things happen with rabbits. I put this slide, this picture on here because it's great and not great at the same time. Do not take the bunnies to a wildlife rehabilitator. That's not the right thing to do, but most of the rest of it is great. Check your yard before you mow. Identify where the rabbits are. Um, if you happen to see a depression in the yard, there's a chance that a rabbit has been using it as a nest. All these things are great, and then leave them alone. If you do need to move them, Move them to another spot of your yard that is maybe safer. Use gloves. So there's a, a lot of people feel, they've been told through the years, that the reason not to handle a wild animal, especially birds, but we're gonna debunk that in a few minutes, um, is because mom won't come back. That is not the case. We have an incredibly strong scent as human beings. And when we handle animals, we put our scent on those animals and we make it a lot easier for predators to find the babies. So if somebody wants to save a, a bunny nest in their yard and they don't um, take precautions, then they're probably just um, leading the fox or the coyote to that nest of, of bunnies. So that would be the reason to wear gloves. White-tailed deer. Anybody here have deer that visit their yard? Not as, not as much of a problem in Arlington Heights. Um, depends on where somebody lives, but they do get into suburban yards. They can go over a fence if it's under eight feet. If it is lower than eight feet, they can go over that fence. Although, I must say it's easier for them to get over chain link and wood fences than some of the metal stake fences. White-tailed deer um, utilize people's yards for a variety of things. They graze, they seek shelter, and they drop a lot of fawn. Those fawn are then left in people's yards while again, mom is gone feeding herself. It, it usually feels like a very secure area. Browsing, I wanna to get to my fawn picture. I get a lot of phone calls at the Nature Center. People say I have an abandoned um, baby deer, fawn, in my yard. And I say, how do you know it's abandoned? It's my first question. And somebody will say, because it's alone. I can promise you there is only one way to know if a fawn is abandoned. You will know by the sound it is making. When a deer hasn't been fed for a long enough time to suspect that it is abandoned, it is screaming, it is a horrible sound. So if you see a fawn in your yard and it's protected, just be thankful that you have an amazing yard that that doe felt was safe enough to deliver her baby and know that probably within a day or two, it'll be gone. Watch it, but don't touch it. Don't feed it, don't handle it. It's not gonna be very mobile and it appears to be injured to many people, but it isn't. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's just hanging out. Now you noticed all of these um, spots on the fawn. Sometimes on a forest floor, that looks like leaves with a sprinkling of sunlight coming through. But in our manicured lawns, it doesn't. It, it really is pretty vivid. But in the forest, it's pretty well camouflaged. As you can see, this is a, a doe with a fawn right next to like a trampoline. Squirrels, the majority of squirrels in our area, of the tree squirrels, 
our gray squirrel. We do have some pockets of, of red, uh, red squirrel, fox squirrel, not red squirrel, fox squirrel, um, but mostly what we have are gray squirrel. Even if they're black, that's just a change in their color. That doesn't, it's not a different species. Um, gray squirrel can be a real nuisance to people. Yes, who said that? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll remember that for a little bit. Gray squirrels can be a nuisance. Um, and why are they a nuisance? Well, because we've provided them with fruit trees, with nut trees, with um, lots of area for them to make nests. Um, we give them great habitat and protect them from a variety of different um, predators. And it's possible that we haven't taken, I'm not saying you, but it's possible that we haven't taken care of our house and there's some wood that has gotten rotted and they are able to get in. Whenever somebody does call the nature center with a squirrel that has gotten into their attic or into their house, I know that it's easy to blame the squirrel, but really we need to know what's going on in our own houses and where our weak spots are and if we have water damage. Sometimes we don't know ahead of time and this is an opportunity to know. We find out because we've got animals in the yard. But squirrels can be um, of great concern to a lot of people. Uh, this is a typical stance that a squirrel will do when it's making an alarm call. This is when I would tell you, definitely don't get near that squirrel. Squirrels are a rodent. They have teeth that grow over and over and over again, front teeth, just like a beaver. And those teeth are quite sharp. And if they are afraid or if they are in any way threatened, they can bite. With any of the animals that I am talking about, if a community or a single person begins to hand feed any of these wild animals, they become imprinted and they can become a problem. They get close to people. Squirrels are one of the, the animals that people love to hand feed. They're cute to some. I got you on that one. They're cute to some. I happen to like them. And um, there are very few animals I don't like, let's just say that. But they are friendly for the most part and they imprint really quickly. We have a lot of people that seem to think that they know how to raise a baby squirrel that falls out of a nest better than the mother, than the mother squirrel. People bring squirrels into their houses, they raise them, and then they release them. Those are the squirrels that get too close to you. Like I said, there is always a reason, and it's usually us that's created the reason why an animal is not acting the way it, it would typically in the wild. This is what the babies look like. They are tiny. And again, they're a rodent. They look exactly like a mouse. Remember I said that if you have bird feeders in your yard that you might be attracting a variety of other animals. So um, deer like to visit the bird feeders. Skunk like to visit the bird feeders. The shrews will visit the bird feeders if they have to, if needed. Uh, the opossum will visit the bird feeders <laughs> underneath. They won't climb up as much. I can't think of too many animals that aren't benefiting from the bird feeding. It doesn't mean you should stop. It means you should recognize if you have a problem in your yard, it could be something that could be controlled better or differently. And there's a whole group of people that um, have a lot of cartoons out there about squirrel yoga. They're not kidding. Those squirrels will do anything to get onto a feeder. <laughs> Chipmunk, this is another kind of squirrel. Uh, this is a ground squirrel, much like a Franklin's ground squirrel or a 13 line ground squirrel, not common up here in Arlington Heights area, but further south in Cook County. Uh, the chipmunk. Some people don't find these to be too much of a problem. I actually find them to be more of a problem than the tree squirrels. They dig. They dig holes underneath our stoops. 
underneath our play equi equipment. Um, they have tunnels. They also like bird feeders. <laughs> Here's a chipmunk in a hole. If you find a hole in your yard and it's about yay big, it's probably a chipmunk. If you see a couple of them, it's even more likely it's a chipmunk. Again, you might want to consider hiring an animal removal company. Um, I think I have time for a quick story. I'm going to try. So people like to show up at the nature center with boxes that have animals inside. We don't accept those animals. Um, but, and people like to just release the animals at the nature center. Again, not legal, not welcome. <laughs> we, we would prefer that you not do that. One particular day, somebody drove in, and one of our non-naturalist staff happened to see this person get out of the car. He was doing work on the grounds, and he saw the person get out of the car with a box. And he approached him and said, what's in the box? And the visitor said, it's a chipmunk I caught in my yard. And my staff said, no, 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 you can't leave that chipmunk here. And the visitor said, no, 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 it's fine. It's, it's not injured. It's just a chipmunk I caught, and I just don't want it in my yard. And with that, he opened up the box. Gosh, I hope this isn't anybody who's sitting in this audience. And the chipmunk jumped up, and a red-tailed hawk swooped down, grabbed the chipmunk, and proceeded to sit right there and eat it. And my staff said, that's why. So, we have, an, we have an abundance of animals. We have exactly what we need. If we don't, then we're working on restoration to make sure the habitat is better. If you are having trouble with an animal in your yard, we would ask that you call us and ask for some support and advice rather than bring the animals to us. Just a public service announcement, please. And then this is what those holes look like in your yard, chipmunk holes. If you find the chipmunks are underneath a stoop, underneath your steps, underneath something that is structurally needing to be sound, that's when it's very important to get somebody out to take care of it, because eventually that stoop might sink. OK, white-footed mice. Now, I could have listed dozens of different kinds of mice. We do not have just one kind of mouse in our region. We have lots of mice. I know that people don't realize this. I picked the white-footed mice because in the fall, they tend to get into our houses a lot, and they're climbers. They are climbers. They'll climb walls. Um, all of us have mice somewhere on our property. We do. It's not a pleasant thing to think about. Um, there's a difference between a house mouse and a white-footed mouse. Um, but if you have bird houses in your yard, if you like to attract birds into the bird houses, this is one of the mice that will take over those nesting boxes during the winter. And I do highly recommend in the spring when cleaning out the boxes to wear a, a dust mask because the droppings from the mouse will still be in the nest box and you could breathe them in. And, and there, are some, there are some things that you don't want to get. So I would just recommend taking care of yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't put bird houses out, or nesting boxes out, or anything like that. And I'm talking about like the wren boxes and bluebird boxes and saw wet owls and things like that. Anybody who likes to bird might will know what I'm talking about. Um, so white-footed mice are very common visitors to our bird feeders. As I told you, they climb. They, and again, I have bird feeders at the Nature Center, bird feeders at my house. I'm well aware of what I am doing. There, we can talk in a little bit about ways to reduce the, um, the, the waste underneath the bird feeders. Um, 
preventing this isn't going to happen. They climb. They jump from trees. They're all over the place. And they get stuck in your bird feeders. If they want some seed, they're going to find a way to get them. It's just a cute picture. What can I say? Oh, this is the worst picture. I'm so sorry. Woodchuck and groundhog. This is the only picture I have of the woodchuck and the groundhog. Anybody have problems with woodchucks? Oh, OK. Yeah, a lot of burrows, right? Yeah. It's so imagine the chipmunk problem and multiply it by like 50. Um, much bigger holes. They have, um, they have a den. They Remember, they hibernate all winter long. Um, they shouldn't be much of a problem to you unless they're close to the house. If they're in the far end of your yard, they shouldn't bother you. They will eat a lot of your garden, though. They will eat the garden. They, are, uh, they will take everything. Um, so woodchucks, they are the one large animal that truly hibernates, large mammal that truly hibernates. You know, we have some bats that hibernate. But the rest of those mammals that we say hibernate are not actually hibernating. It's another word. We call it torpor. And that means they just sleep, and then they wake up when it's warm, and then they sleep again. But woodchucks cannot come out of hibernation until it's the right time. If they do, they won't find enough food to be able to help support them to get back into hibernation. So woodchucks are eating all summer and fall in order to have enough supply, body, oops, body weight, body fat, to get them through that hibernation. There's a purpose for everything in nature. That's why they're doing it. And so as a result, they eat a lot. Um, and honestly, if you're having a problem with woodchucks, I would suggest uh, quite a few, you know, a few things. First of all, an animal removal company. I'm not recommending any in particular. I'm just letting you know that that's the way to go. Again, they have very sharp teeth. You don't want to be handling them. And um, secondly, to look at how you're doing your gardening a little bit differently. Maybe some raised beds. Maybe using some kind of wire that you dig underneath the garden and um, give yourself a little bit more of a frame to keep the um, wood checks from, from digging through. So, and we could talk about that more. Since not a lot of people have that problem, I'm going to skip on to red fox. Aren't they cute? Anybody have any foxes that they've noticed in their yards? Have you ever seen goose heads on your lawn in the morning? Nobody? With all these foxes? No? Yeah, so if we, when we get um, calls in the wintertime for um, a variety of, of goose heads in the yard, it's usually the fox. They eat the rest of the, of the goose, and they leave the head. So um, foxes have been pushed out of a lot of the forest preserve property by the coyotes. The coyotes are adapted to just about every habitat, every place, everywhere in North America and Central and moving into South America. And, um, and so the foxes have less habitat in the forest preserves, but they have a whole lot of habitat in our yards. So um, again, foxes are finding things in our yards. If we have foxes, it's usually because there's something in the yard. Pleasantly, they're usually going after rodents, like this fox is doing in the winter. They can find those tunnels, and they're eating those rodents. I would prefer to have the foxes and not have the mice myself. Um, foxes love bird feeders. <laughs> So not only do they like you know, the seed, but there's a lot of rodents, as I've told you, and a lot of other animals that hang out underneath the bird feeders. And so they've got a smorgasbord. I will tell you, if you do have foxes in the spring, and they do have a den, and they do end up rearing kits, it is some of the most special nature watching you can get. They are playful, like a cross between a cat and a dog. 
They are fun. They are hands off with us. They don't bother people, but they don't let people bother them. They will continue to play and teach their, their kids, their young, even if people are watching them. And they go about their business and they, again, really do help with the population of rodents in our yards. And I can't say this enough. No matter how manicured your yard is, no matter where you live, we all have rodents in our yards. They're there. <laughs> now we're getting into some of the animals that cause a little bit more trouble. Um, raccoons, they love bird feeders. <laughs> Um, so I, maybe we should have named this all the animals that love bird feeders. <laughs> so look at how big this raccoon is. Okay. So raccoons are, um, very common in our yards. I rarely have people that have, that call to complain about the raccoons. For whatever reason, people put up with the raccoons more than a lot of other animals. Um, but if a raccoon does get into somebody's house, it's another story. I want to be very clear that raccoons in your attic or raccoons in any part of your house needs a deep cleaning. Raccoons have a, they are a carrier of a roundworm that is, that is, um, comes out in their feces. And it needs to be cleaned professionally. That's not to say that every raccoon has it. But you should be precautious and you should be proactive about it. Because it can be very harmful to anybody with um, some kind of immune issues or young children. So just think about that. I'm not saying that if you see a raccoon in your backyard, that's you know, a reason to call or to be worried. I'm just telling you if they get into your attic or into your house in some way, besides having the raccoons removed, the house does need professional cleaning. Okay? Um, raccoons can be very aggressive and assertive when they are pregnant. Okay? A lot of times we find the raccoons to be the most damaging during the time that they're looking to find a place to have their babies. They'll rip things apart. They'll find the weakness in the attic, in the wood, in the siding. They'll, sometimes they've gotten into cars, okay? It's not typical, but it's happened. So. Um, just be aware that it's that springtime when they are a little bit more um, aggressive of getting into, I'm so sorry, getting into our spaces. But in the yard, they go in and out. I mean, if you have a porch and it has an opening, you're going to have animals under there. If you have a, um, a, um, a shed and it's not on the ground, and there's an opening, you're going to have animals under there. We're giving animals spaces in those situations. So these are the kinds of places that they like to be. We also need to make sure to secure the garbage cans. Squirrels, by the way, are also notorious for chewing through garbage cans. Raccoons will use the garbage cans once those garbage cans are chewed through by the squirrel. Somebody earlier asked me about um, a plastic hose reel that was chewed up. Squirrel. I mean, the, when, they're, when they want to chew on something, they'll do it. They'll damage things. Our, you know, the, the garbage cans that we get from the village, they chew right through those. So depending on, yeah, they have those, they have, they have strong teeth. Um, gar the raccoons will knock over garbage cans if they smell something, if you're not keeping your garbage cans closed well enough, if you're not securing them, um, if you have the ability to put a small garbage shed up for them, 
that's a great way to keep a lot of animals out of the garbage can. Uh, I don't like to facilitate or, or you know, encourage this kind of thought that raccoons only live in our garbage cans, but they love it if we give it to them. And once they have it, they're not gonna go back to eating wild things. Once a lot of animals get into our houses, if we don't do the right thing to get them out, they'll find their way back in because we provide them with great habitat once they're in our houses. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you the, the, the bird feeders at the Nature Center in the wintertime, what we try to do to keep the raccoons and the squirrels off of our bird feeders is, uh, it's like a Rube Goldberg. I mean, we're, we are absolutely trying everything we can to keep them off and they always get to them. They figure something out. Okay, I bet you didn't know that you were gonna learn about woodpeckers tonight. Instead of um, putting together uh, different slides about the different woodpeckers, I just thought that this was easy enough. Every single one of these woodpeckers is found in our area. Chance of you having a pileated woodpecker in your backyard is not likely. Um, we are so excited at River Trail. We have a male pileated woodpecker that has been drumming his head off since March. Um, it's like, you know, the size of a crow with a huge chisel on the end of his beak or his head. And uh, that's really cool. The northern flicker, not as much of an issue either, but the rest of them, possibility. And um, okay, so this is one of the reasons why some of us put bird feeders up, is to attract the woodpeckers to our yards. Okay, love the woodpeckers, right? Who are the birders in this? In this audience, yeah, we love the woodpeckers coming to our bird feeders. Um, but the woodpeckers can be, can have a lot of damage on the yard and on the house if they should choose to pick your house. And sometimes it's by chance and sometimes it's because we have rotting wood <laughs> or because um, we have those shingles that are made of cedar the roof, those shaker roof shingles. Yeah, because insects love to lay their eggs inside those wood shingles, and then the woodpeckers eat the young larvae. I mean, this is, a, this is great, it's a circle of life, right? And um, who wants insects inside their roof? But then you're gonna end up with woodpeckers pecking all over the um, shingle, the roof of your house. They also can get onto the side of the house. If you should see something like this, it's usually a yellow belly sapsucker who is very confused. Yellow belly sapsuckers need to peck holes in a row around the tree so that the sap drips out and insects are attracted to the sap. And then they eat the insects. The other woodpeckers do a little more damage. We've even had this happen at the Nature Center. I have a really great fix. Usually works, but as Bob said earlier, if something doesn't work, try something else. I mean, sometimes it just doesn't work for whatever reason. Um, if you do have problems with woodpeckers, I highly recommend, it is not the most attractive, but I highly recommend for temporarily putting up a CD or a disc using, again, so sorry, using um, fishing line and hang it so that the woodpeckers are seeing these, the, the, first of all, the disc is so lightweight that it moves with the slightest amount of air. And it twirls and it creates a lot of light and reflection and shiny and it scares the woodpeckers. Usually if you can hang it near to where they are, um, drilling their holes. So woodpeckers do the pecking for two different things. Three different things, actually. The first one is they're drumming to attract a mate. And that can just go on over and over and over again. Each woodpecker has a different pattern of drumming. It's, it's actually really cool. Um, the second reason is that they're 
drilling a hole to make a nest. That would be something like that. And the third reason is that they are picking insects out of the wood, either out of a tree or out of the wood. Now, if a woodpecker is confused, like one was at my house recently, and was pecking on vinyl siding, that's another story. Um, but once it doesn't get anything, it, it usually doesn't come back. But if it does, again, hanging a CD um, is helpful. Now, if you don't have a cherry picker to come and, and hang a CD from the top of your house, just try to find somebody who has a good ladder who is able to get on the roof and hang it from somewhere high up. Use one of those, you know, those, um, whatever, those stick-on hooks or whatever. What are they called? Command. The command hooks or something. You know, it doesn't have to be permanent, um, but try that out first. Sometimes um, forks bent in all different ways will work, but now that we have discs, don't even try the fork. Uh, wind chimes can sometimes help. A lot of different hanging um, things that, but not the big wind chimes, by the way. You know, those need a lot of wind, right? One of the small little wind chimes. The problem with wind chimes is that they figure out a pattern. So I do like the disc better. And then here's another example of a woodpecker pecking his way through the door. I decided to put this one in because a lot of people have a problem with this bird in their yard. I grew up in a uh, in suburb of Chicago area, north suburb, and there were some shrubs that I would walk past to get to the park and to get to school. And always there was a red-winged blackbird nesting that would attack me on my way past the shrubs. Um, male red-winged blackbirds are incredibly fierce and territorial and um, mean. Well, you know what, I don't think of them as mean because they're doing what they need to do in order to protect their, their babies and, their, and the female. Um, but I understand why you think they're mean. Um, because they're scary when it's happening. It, it is scary when it's happening to each of us. And, and I relate and I can understand that. Uh, but I wouldn't put those kinds of feelings into what animals are doing. Um, so there are ways of handling these kinds of issues. Is this something that you will handle when there's a red-winged blackbird in the nest, in, the, in a shrub? Yeah. So yeah, you can have something with you, like a, an umbrella to put up if it, if it, as you're walking past it, things like that. Um, if you have it in your yard, um, it doesn't, it's not very long that they will be uh, doing that. Um, it is illegal to handle bird nests that are native. It's a federal law. It's not a state, it's not a county. It is illegal. Um, you can always call U.S. Fish and Wildlife and ask them for some advice and, and things like that. Um, but I recommend that just leave them be. It won't take very long. Call me at the Nature Center and I can tell you how long, et cetera. But um, sometimes they nest because it's so protected. So maybe look at the shrub that you have in the yard and maybe thin it out a little bit. That might help, okay? Before I get to the main uh, event of the program, I want to touch on great horned owls. Uh, coyotes get blamed for just about everything, and I want to remind everybody that great horned owls take a significant number of dogs and cats out of yards, and people never realize that. I've seen it happen. I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've seen it happen twice. And we have found, um, we, uh, biologists have found cat and dog um, collars in great horned owl nests when they've gone into the nest to band the young owlets. So don't think that it's always a coyote. It gets blamed for, it gets blamed for everything that is bad in people's yards. Um, 
Great horned owl is fierce. The great horned owl is the main predator of striped skunks in our area. Want to reduce your skunks? Let's have some more owls. But here's our problem. So many people are using services to remove those rodents out of their, out of their houses, and the services are using pellets, and those pellets are poison. And that poison gets into the owls and the hawks and the coyote and the fox, and we're seeing that it has a very big impact on the great horned owl. Our great horned owls are reducing in numbers, habitat loss, and they're being poisoned essentially by too much um, insecticide or, or rodent aside being used. So consider that if you have a problem with um, rodents, with mice, consider snap trapping to start. And I can talk about that in a little bit. Cooper's hawk. Those of you who are birders probably know Cooper's hawk, and maybe you want to attract a Cooper's hawk into your yard. Cooper's hawk was actually an endangered species in our state when I first started with the forest preserves. And it is no longer on the endangered or threatened species list. And we've got lots of them, especially in our neighborhoods. Uh, Cooper's hawk benefit from the bird feeding. <laughs> they ambush birds at the feeders. I don't mind when they take the house sparrow and the, and the morning dove. I'm so sorry to say that. Um, I'm sorry. The, there's nothing wrong with the morning dove. But the other day, I did see a Cooper's hawk at River Trail with a rose-breasted grosbeak in its talon. Those of you who are birders know how special that is. So, um, yuck. But it happens. It's the way it works. Cooper's hawks are, um, you'll find big stick nests in a variety of trees. They make dummy nests. They'll make a bunch of nests and they'll only use one. Sometimes you don't see those nests until the, um, the fall when all the leaves come off the trees. Babies in general. People love to call us about baby animals. <laughs> Turtles, rabbits, birds. For the most part, we want people to let nature take its course. Um, when to take something to a wildlife rehabilitator? When it's an adult and it's injured. When an animal is young, infant, baby, just born, fledgling, etc., and it's handled by people, by human beings, it, it actually associates with what is raising it. We're talking about mammals and birds. We're not talking about reptiles, fish, amphibians. We're talking about mammals and birds. And so it's best to let babies sometimes become food for other animals that need it. That's, that's part of what they're there for. It's part of the cycle. But Animals that are adults and are injured, broken wing, um, maybe something around the neck, and it can be captured, and you choose to do that, and you choose to look up online for a wildlife rehabilitator to take it to, it might possibly be repaired, helped, and then released. But most often, baby animals that are taken Raised by us, all of us, oh good lord, I can't believe I keep doing that, or raised by rehabilitators don't have much chance. It's just not as likely. Wildlife rehabilitation is really about us. We want to help every single animal as people, as human beings. Not always the best option for the animal. It really isn't. And happy to discuss this a little bit further later. Stinging insects. People love these. Um, so I'm showing you honeycomb and honeybees, a um, bald-faced hornet nest, and a paper wasp nest. These are three of the more common ones. I 
couldn't fit a um, yellow jacket on there. And, um, but stinging insects, we have people who will come out and, and remove stinging insect nests if you're gonna do it yourself and it's not a honeybee or another kind of bee, then um, do it at night when they're all in the nest and they're not going to attack you for attacking them. You can always call us for advice on this. Um, I said not native bees and honeybees. I mean, we do have a problem with pollinators at the moment. And it is nice sometimes to keep some of those pollinators around. Chance of them bothering you depends on where the nest is located. And this is an individual issue that you can call the Nature Center and ask for advice, ask for support. But um, each individual situation could be different. Okay, now we're getting to that one last animal that I think most of you came for, I'm not sure. But uh, Bob talked a lot about this earlier. I've got a little satire up here on the, on the screen. I'm gonna read it, I don't know it by heart. It says, the Bay Village Police Department, there have been coyote sightings within the Bay Village. Typically, coyotes are nocturnal, but it is not uncommon to see them during the day. Merely seeing one is not reason to call the police. However, there are certain behaviors that would be a cause for alarm. Specifically, coyote carrying a box marked Acme. <laughs> coyote dropping an anvil from a hot air balloon. Coyote posting signs such as detour or free bird seed. There's that bird seed again. Coyote in possession of a giant magnet. Coyote in possession of a catapult. Coyote detonating explosives, or TNT, and coyote launching itself with a giant, what does it say, crossbow. Okay, so I'm sure I got that point across. So um, Bob is correct. We as well get lots of calls that somebody sees a coyote. They see a coyote while they're walking the dog. They see a coyote on their way to work. They see a coyote on the side of the road while they're driving to work. They see a coyote at night in their yard. There's all different situations and a lot of people want those coyotes out of their yards and out of their neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of background on coyotes in Cook County because Forest Preserves of Cook County has the single largest urban coyote project in the world. We have, over, we have studied over 800 coyotes that have been captured, collared, and tagged. Followed them, observed them, continued to take um, blood samples and a variety of information from them in order to keep this research up to date. On the sheet that Bob passed out with resources, it mentions the Urban, Urban Coyote, Cook County, Cook County Urban Coyote Project. And you can go online and get information about um, the study. But this is where we've gotten the majority of our research and information about coyotes from, is this like 15 year study. It may be 12 year study, I'm, on, I'm being filmed, so. Um, I wish I knew the exact date. Coyote have found a space in just about every habitat throughout North America, that includes Canada, and includes Central America, and in, go, they're in South America as well. Coyote have adapted very well to a variety of, um, of habitats as needed. At one point, there was a single coyote that utilized the Ikea pond for its entire habitat, its entire life. Yeah, I see I like to show you the puppies because they're so cute. Maybe you might like a coyote a little bit better. Coyote are so well at adapting Look at the closed quarters that these coyote pups are in. This could be your backyard. 
That is the tree hole. I mean, I can't tell you how many trees I have like this at River Trail. They can use a tree that's fallen over and they can make that into their den. Um, coyotes will utilize a lot of space in our yards and we never know it. The majority of coyote are going through their life doing their business and we don't know about it. They are in our yards. They're in our backyards, they're in our playgrounds, they're in our shopping centers. They're there and they're not bothering us. But there are some coyotes that are getting into trouble and giving coyote a bad name, that's for sure. When we, what was that? Did you say ew? It's just teeth. Um, so, so the reason I showed this slide is uh, when the forest preserve biologists um, capture a, a coyote in order to tag it and collar it, they take blood work on the coyote, they do a variety of different tests, and they look at the teeth. A coyote that is living in the wild and is hunting in the wild, no matter the age, the, the teeth will be worn down, but no matter the age, they'll have teeth that look pretty good. A coyote that's being hand-fed, a coyote that's getting into garbage, they're gonna have teeth that look like this. Human food. When we handle coyotes, even when they're those puppies, when they look so cute, when we give them, when we feed them, put out food for them, dog food, cat food, bread, anything. Number one, we are causing them to get mixed signals about what is right. Number two, we are really not giving them the best diet that is healthy for them. And number three, we are creating a problem. The majority of coyotes that have had problems in our neighborhoods have been coyotes that we have found human food in their stomachs when they go for the, for animals, it's a necropsy instead of an autopsy, but when they go and they get examined after, after death, um, we find human food in their stomachs. We find that they have gotten, either gotten into something, garbage, or they've been purposely fed. If you know of neighbors that are feeding coyote, if you know of neighbors that are trying to attract coyote into their yards. If that's you, please think it through and please let authorities know because these are the, the coyotes that become a problem for our pets. These are the ones that are extraterritorial. These are the ones that walk up to people because they think they're gonna get a handout. Coyotes that are just in our neighborhoods shouldn't bother you unless they have been improperly handled. So what to do if you see a coyote? Bob already talked a little bit about it. Um, I'm gonna reiterate. So Bob is the one who taught me about that sprinkler. Great idea if you can do it. But if you can't, um, besides a whistle, I like an air horn a small boat air horn. Now I one time told somebody who called, she was uh, complaining about letting her dog out at night because a coyote kept visiting her yard. And I, and I told her about buying the, the boat air horn. She called me back a few days later and she said, my neighbors are really upset with me. <laughs> and I said, well, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, you had a coyote that many times in your yard? She said, no, I." I do the air horn before I let the dog out. No, that is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> Using the air horn to scare the coyote if you see it. Just like the whistle, just like throwing some small rocks. Not my favorite thing, but in a, in a pinch, yeah. Um, making yourself large, you know, screaming, stomping your feet. If you're walking your dog, 
The single biggest advice I can give you right now, stop using those retractable leashes. I know a woman who, using a retractable leash, and the dog went out around a corner, and she couldn't see it, and there was a coyote around the corner. If you can't see where your dog is going, the dog at night shouldn't go there. I mean, it could have been a skunk. Um, but the retractable leashes, they, I mean, they have their place. So I have a German uh, short hair pointer and a golden retriever. The golden retriever couldn't harm a flea, but the German short hair, I put her on a retractable um, leash to go in my fenced yard at night to go to the bathroom. <clears throat> because if she sees something in the yard, she's going to attack it. So I just use that to control her at night in my own yard. But I don't take her on walks with that leash. She can get way too far ahead of me. So um, when walking a dog, have some of these things with you. An air horn, a whistle, mace. If you have a problem with a coyote in your yard, and it's getting close enough, and please, everybody, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I want you to think about when you are reporting these things to the police or to a nature center, how much you're exaggerating, or not. It may not be, but you know how close it's really getting, what it's really doing, is it really following you, okay? And if it is, if it is, mace is an excellent source of, de of deterrent. We, as uh, the biologists, use the mace when it's, um, especially like when we have, I know you're probably laughing, like, I don't want to be that close, but um, what was that? <laughs> okay, f I mean, there are some other things, there are a lot of home, a lot of things that we can do for, you know, using um, pepper spray and things like that. Um, but, yeah, it, it will work. The biologists, when we have a drought summer season and the coyotes will get into the yards because they are just so hungry. And mace is very effective in chasing them away. Okay. So now we are at our question and answer. <laughs> One minute. Somebody over here had their hand up first. Is it just for me? I think um, Bob and Vicky are going to come up here as well. I just have a question. When, when experts uh, trap skunks, uh, how do they keep them from spraying? Is they don't. They, they just let them spray? What are you going to do? They're inside, a, they're inside a cage. Yeah. I, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes they still can spray. We have activated light in the backyard. Can you give them the, yeah, motion activated, motion activated lights activated are great. Light, but they trigger spray and then the house just seeps in there. It stinks like mm -hmm. crazy all night long. And next, Do you know for sure day. that the, the, wait one second. Do you know for sure that the, well, that the, the light is triggering the spray? The, the smell was concentrated in the patio where the light is. So okay, so maybe um, I find sometimes my husband, I, I don't know if my husband's going to watch this, but my husband does this all the time. He drops the light down right onto the patio instead of lighting up yeah. further into the whole yard. Right. So maybe you can spread that light a little bit further and it won't be right when the skunk... So why is the skunk getting onto your patio is what I'd like to know. Looking for food, I guess. Okay, so something's going on in your yard. All right. So maybe after this program, you might want to go back and look and see what you think might be attracting the skunk to your yard. Okay. That's coming awfully close to your house. And, and in closing, I just want to say, ban bird feeders. <laughs> no, but thank you. That's very funny. <laughs> I don't know. If I, I don't think I have to stand, but the, I've always heard that you shouldn't use the bird feeders in the summertime because the birds have lots of other things to eat. So generally, I don't do it in the summertime and just wait until fall well, and winter. It's true. They need the bird seed more in the winter 
And, but it doesn't mean that you can't um, feed in the summer. For example, the Orioles eat the grape jelly, the hummingbirds eat the sugar water, drink the sugar water. Um, the bird feeders right now during migration are very important for the tanagers and the buntings and um, the grosbeaks and all of and all of the other birds that'll come to the feeders. So it's, it's all your preference. But in the summer, they don't have you don't have to feed them as much. Sure, I would like to say real quickly. I heard somebody talking about. I think it was Bob that mentioned feeding bread um, to animals. Instead of banning the bird feeders, let's ban bread feeding. Um, I will tell you that bread feeding is incredibly bad health-wise for birds. It creates some really bad diseases in birds, and it can actually kill them. So let's stop feeding bread to birds. Only feed things that, na that are natural in their form. Crack corn, seed, um, things like that. Peanuts. Um, I, uh, I had the experience of a, a possum getting electrocuted, and he fell across the, my, a, a fence between my neighbors and so forth. And so I called the animal people, and uh, I said, uh, first of all, how do I get rid of this thing? And can I throw it in the garbage? And they said, no, you can't do that. You got to call animal welfare or whatever. And uh, I said, well, whose responsibility is it? And he said, well, if it falls in your yard, it's your responsibility. I said, well, it fell over the fence. So, <laughs> so I thought that was rather funny. But the real issue is you cannot throw it in the garbage. Is that correct? <laughs> Gray area. Gray area. I, I'm not in any way condoning it, but that's, I don't, I don't know who's going to find out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that this is, there's a, there's a lot of different um, rules out there by different municipalities. I'm assuming most of you are from Arlington Heights, but um, I, I'm not sure that that is um, always the case. Hey, if you have something that dies in your yard and it's in good shape, I'll take it at the Nature Center, by the way. We taxidermy everything. You know, just to tie a ribbon around that question, because obviously there's some discussion within the room if it is good or bad or allowed or otherwise. If I come to your house to provide you a service and I'm going to remove something from public way or as a public service, your property, it's going in a dumpster. There's no other place to put it. So it, it just is. That's just the way we're going to aim. I have, um, you know, little grandkids that come over in the backyard and I have a fence backyard. Aside from like the grub treatment thing, because I have gone out and I've seen a possum, I've seen a skunk. I've seen Are they a... playing outside at night on their own? I, I just see them walk across. No, your kids, your oh. grandchildren. Uh, no, no. I mean, I have them, they like to play in the yard, but I've seen the poop from these animals mm. and I've heard that that's very dangerous for the little kids. Is there anything? I can do besides the grub thing to, to get them out of your yard. Yeah, just to so there's not. Well, let's you know do one thing at a time. Do a grub treatment, okay. and and then see if that um, gets the skunks out of the yard. And and then if you need to do, so, do you have a lot of people in your neighborhood bird feeding? Is there something else that's attracting? Do you have a shed in the yard that they could be under? She said uh, when she watched her son's dog, he went crazy by mm -hmm. the deck. Yeah, so that's usually, I mean, that's a lot of times that's what happens. Um, and that's something to discuss with her. Maybe you can split the cost of, of calling in um, an animal removal company to, to look. Yeah. As far as removing um, feces from a yard, if you should choose to do that, I mean, put on a pair of rubber gloves and just like you would maybe a um, if you had dog uh, feces in the yard, it, it's not the worst thing. I have to do it all the time. But um, it's not the worst thing. You can, you can remove it if you had to. Especially if you're seeing it, I would just pick it up. But find out why you've got them in your yard. And just to kind of reemphasize some of the earlier discussions as well, in this situation you're describing where you have grandchildren playing, hear you. where you have grandchildren playing in the yard during um, 
obviously spring and summer months, I would really consider the motion activated sprinkler head something that's going to protect your yard um, throughout the nighttime. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a neighbor that um, is very proud of trying to trap and kill chipmunks. Oh, that is against the law, is it not? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's again. If you trap, if you trap the animal, the what the county says you're allowed to do is release it on your own property. He's trapping them on his own property, so I don't know. So you got to release it on your own property. Right, but he's not. He's killing them. Correct. So that would be something to, and I mean, you know, I don't have any authority I to for anything like that. But you could call DNR, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, and ask them the question. I will. And I mean, other neighbors have called the police because this man is crazy with killing animals. I mean, and I think someone has visited him, but I don't know if it made a dent. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, this, this does happen. Sometimes we have people who are trying to kill all the animals, and believe it or not, we have people who are trying to attract all of the animals into their yard, Most and we've had, to yard. we've had to confiscate, you know, um, animals from houses. Not we, DNR, Illinois Department of Natural Resources. I don't know why I keep saying we. <laughs> I'm just part of this whole group of people. Who's next? Have you any suggestions with the... Talk into the microphone. Oh, have you any suggestions for squirrels? I plant in the morning, and late afternoon, they pull out. I start here, and I walk all the way. Yeah. Next morning, I start here all the way. That can go on for a week. I have chased them. They go up the tree and they get just out of reach, turn around, look down at me, and chatter at me. Yeah. And I don't feed them. I had a neighbor that used to feed them years, uh, the last few summers, but he's gone. And my yard is no bigger than those screens, and I get three and four squirrels at a time partying in my backyard. Is there anything to distract them? Yeah, so have you tried any kind of, of deterrence? Red pepper. Black pepper, <laughs> pepper, um, even mothballs, which just ammonia. smells lovely. It, I know, I can't come. stand the ammonia, but have you tried the ammonia as well? What, what else? Ammonia, are? blood meal. Oh, yeah, blood meal. Oh, I've tried that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm running out of ideas. I really um, am. Okay, so another um, option, which is good for deer and for some animals, it may or may not work, is when you go to the beauty salon, collect the hair that has been cut, and put the hair into um, pantyhose um, bundles and hang them or put them or sprinkle it all over in the yard. Um, another thing to do is to find some kind of cover to deter them for a short amount of time. Screening? Or, you know, baskets or whatever for, for a short amount of time and, and try to deter them. Um, in the short run, and maybe they'll unfortunately go to somebody else's house, but. Um, I'm the other one that gardens right there. Yeah. The others don't garden, so there's no one. When you, be, take one of the brochures and, and give us a call at the Nature Center and let's see what, what, what else we can come up with. Michelle, if I could, I just had some unsolicited support from the audience and they also recommended catnip lavender. Okay, great. Shows. Yeah. Sometimes, and, and again, cat, no. certain, <laughs> cer yeah, certain, um, I did not talk about feral cats, that's funny. Certain um, garden centers, I'm not necessarily thinking big box centers, but some of our long standing garden centers that have been around a long time have um, wonderful employees that are a wealth of information for gardeners. So you might want to try some of those long-standing garden shops. No, not to diss Home Depot or Menards or anything. Who's? I did want to ask you about feral cats. Can they survive in the winter if you don't feed them? Yes? Well, yes, yeah, somebody's feeding them. Oh, okay. So we. <laughs> 
What should we do if we have a feral cat in our yard? Should is it a single or is it a colony? One. Oh, well, get animal control out to trap it. And what do they do with it? <laughs> That's different. A feral cat, a feral cat um, is not released. A feral cat um, is most likely euthanized because a lot of the a lot of the shelters won't take the feral cats. I try to it and put it in a box or something and try to keep it alive. Yeah. Well, do you want it in your house as a as a pet? <laughs> Sometimes, yes, and other times, no. Okay, so any amount of feeding the wild animals out, so, you know, all of this, like I said, when we put out food for the cats, they're not the only ones who are eating it. You're feeding the opossum, the raccoon, the skunks, the coyote, the fox, the mice, the chipmunks, a the, the, you know, a variety of other animals, and the cats. Um, and it's, it's really not the healthiest for them. The reason that they are, am I correct? They're usually euthanized. Am I correct? We do not do that, but other towns do. So we, if we Cook County Animal Control, I believe, euthanizes them. Yeah. We don't do feral cats at all. Here, okay. Unless there's a problem. So the reason that that happens is because they are generally not able to become domestic. They're too far gone in terms of how long they've been living outside, and there are so many cats that need to be um, adopted already. And it's a shame, I'm not advocating for you know, euthanizing animals, but it, it, is the, um, it is what happens. And it's part of the problem is that people feed them. And you know, Michelle, not to be the heavy, in the room, but um, in Arlington Heights, we do not regulate cats. Um, so they're not licensed, they don't have to be leashed. Um, they do have to be inoculated for rabies, but otherwise feral cats are wild animals. Um, so if the circumstances should arise where we're dealing with a feral cat, there's no difference than dealing with an injured possum. It's gonna be the same ending. It's just the way it is. But I've, I've taken them in and I've taken care of them and loved them. So it's maybe a neighbor or something Sure, and there's a lot of love in the room, and you can feel that now, but the one thing that I do want to reemphasize, obviously, is that Arlington Heights additionally does regulate the feeding of wild animals. Um, you cannot, um, unless you're registered as a feral cat colony supporter, caregiver, you cannot put out um, dishes of food wantonly and then draw wild animals to your yard that's regulated and you can be cited if your neighbor was to call 911. I would like to add, as long as I'm, I have an opportunity for a PSA, um, if you do have pet cats and allow them to go outside, please put bells on them to support um, the safety of our wild birds, which we feed. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, squirrel feeding, hap squirrel feeding happens along with the birds. I know Northbrook, which is where River Trail Nature Center is located, had a difficult time with this, where you're not allowed to feed the wild animals. There's a variety of ways that it, bird feeding is allowed. And you don't want to put too much food down on the ground that it's overfeeding where it's left over because that causes problems too. Squirrel feeding along with the birds is part, I mean, it depends on how you feed them. If you put a... If, it depends on how your neighbor feeds them. Well, that would be something for you to talk to your um, community about and find out what the what the rule is, and see you know how you can communicate with your with your neighbor. Um, generally, like you saw a variety of different pictures where we had just a single corn cob at the nature center. That's how we tend to choose to feed the squirrels is with um, a corn cob that is dried for animal food, uh, rather than putting out loads of seed on the ground. Okay, so again, bread is a problem. Yeah, bread is a problem. The added bonus burden to that kind of situation and the thing that is, it, that is required of the complainant in a situation like that 
is if there are citations that are going to be written, you're the complaining party. So it does involve court time, and there's no getting around it. I can't be the complainant in your issue. Um, so when it comes to that type of problem, therein lies the impasse. Um, because unless you want to step up to sign the complaint, and that's, that's always a, a requirement of our judicial process. Thank you. Any more questions? Couple? He's Are there many beaver in our area? Yeah, I didn't talk about beaver. Yeah, we have a lot of beaver. Um, for the most part, they, they aren't usually a backyard problem, so I didn't put it into the presentation. Uh, we also have river otter that have been reintroduced into our river systems. Um, one, because they were extirpated and it's cool to have otters, river otters, but two, because we needed something to help control the beaver population. And the otters are carnivores. And they can get into those lodges. They're swimmers and they can get up and in. We have, we live in North Arlington Heights up near Nickel Knoll and Buffalo Creek. And uh, there have been beaver up there. They were building a dam and the village has, well, they took the dam down. They had a trapper come out. Okay. Who I happen to run into and talk to. On your walk in, beaver, in uh, <laughs> Buffalo Creek? <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, I just thought, you know, I hate to see them take the, the dam down. Could they just open it up and let the water flow through? They'll redo it. Yeah, I know. Well, hey, I would be willing to go in and remove it every day for it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> really okay. I, if you're that interested in volunteering, you're welcome to come out to the Nature Center. I was just thinking about that while I was listening. Love to have you. Who has the microphone? I do. Question about bunnies uh, and just how destructive they are. They eat things that they're not supposed to like. And I even planted some bushes last year, like small lilacs, rows of Sharon's. After the winter, they're pretty much chewed down to maybe two to three. And inches. for sure it wasn't the deer? I don't, I've never seen a deer okay. in my yard. Okay. Yeah, and I've been told by my landscaper that it's the rabbits. So the best way to, first of all, the best, best way to handle a new planting is to put a tall cage around it for the first couple of years. I did that this weekend, but it's yeah. a little bit late. It's a little late on that, but that's okay. I mean, maybe it'll come back, maybe yeah, not. It's, it's, Lilac is pretty hardy. Um, and, and, um, and as long as it doesn't keep getting cut down, it'll, it'll still grow. But, um, but in terms of removing the rabbits from the yard, I mean, again, um, let the rabbit. Uh, this is a really hard thing to say, but not every bunny in everybody's yard has to survive. You know, sometimes the rabbits are protected, uh, the bunnies, and then, and then we've got all these rabbits in the yard. Dogs in the yard will, will prevent them, um, push them. You have a dog or you don't? You don't have a dog. So can you get you know, a neighbor's dog to pee in your yard? Well, the neighbors do have dogs, and I think what that causes is the bunnies to run into my yard. <laughs> right. It is exactly what's happening. But maybe you can use some of their, um, you can collect, you can, you can ask them if, if they might let you collect some of that poo and put it around your, um, around the barrier, the fence line, or around the boundary of the, of the yard, and Maybe you can get them to get a few different neighbors to have some dogs um, pee around the border. I'm not kidding. I know it sounds absolutely so ridiculous. For, yeah, tell them to. I mean, um, I would consider it. Um, a male in your household could do it too. Um, seriously, I hope my bosses don't see this. <laughs> um, Just don't get yourself in trouble. Um, another thing that you can do, again, is to, is some, do you want to say it out loud, what you're recommending? What are you recommending? So they, they don't jump and they don't climb. So if you put short chicken wire, make a loop around, around the plant, but it's really alone. Correct, but a lot of times they can, I mean, you can't put a, all the way around everything the whole summer. It depends on how you want your yard to look. But that is why they have 
rabbit fences. I'm assuming you already have fences up and they're still getting in. No, 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 you're plantings. Correct. So that's why I'm giving you some other, some other options. Um, there are a variety of um, other, you know, holistic ways of doing it. But again, some of these garden centers have some, some products that you should try. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is helpful is something that scares it, makes it think that there's a predator in the yard. Again, those flashing discs that I was talking about for the woodpeckers, do it lower and see if that works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Michelle, we are going to wrap up, so we're going to go to two different last questions, and then Vicki and I, and, and I'm trusting you as well, will be in the audience or at least in the room for a couple of bonus minutes sure. at the end. I just had a question about woodpeckers. So <laughs> we have um, cedar siding. So if the woodpeckers are making holes in the cedar siding, that, that means that you have insects probably inside the wood? Yes, it's chances are that you've got some insects in there. That doesn't mean it's bad, but it's wood. And insects lay their eggs sometimes, in, depending on the insect, in, in the wood. Like a lot of bark beetles lay their eggs underneath the bark, and those um, cedar shingles are very never similar. I've bothered with woodpeckers for, I mean, like 20 years, then all of a sudden, the last couple of Correct. years. So you may over. not have had those insects in there until recently. The newer shingles don't tend to get them because they've got, they're coated. And then eventually it wears off. When was the last time you had your roof done? Five, six years ago? Yeah, so it's siding. starting to, oh, it's the siding? Yeah. So yeah, it's starting to. I mean, um, Again, I would try to deter it and um, fill in any kind of large hole. Uh, speak with some handy men or handy women about um, handy people about doing some kind of work on the on the shingles. As far as products, I know that there are a lot of products online for woodpeckers. I think the best is the um, is the disc, but you got to try it first and see how it works. And a lot of them, not just one. Anybody who's using those discs, don't put one up. You need a lot. Okay. I think you can also, there's products out there. You maintain the, the cedar siding, um, you know, by, by sealing it and all that. Keep up with that. Then sometimes it'll keep the bugs out. Correct. I'm surprised nobody, I didn't put in my um, presentation carpenter bees, but that's another one that they can get into those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> okay. So uh, do skunks have memory? I have a family, what happened was the landscaper next door did some digging and disrupted a skunk's nest. And this skunk during the day carried all of her babies and she found a niche under my porch and it took cement stairs, under the cement stairs she got in there. So I've gotten rid of six so far, but it can be very expensive, as you mentioned. But there's another one that keeps coming around, and it, it follows the same path. Mm -hmm. I, I, like clockwork, I know when that skunk is coming. So it's not memory. It's scent. Okay, so it's I scent. bought the skunk keeper away, it's the pellets that you're supposed to pour down there. So I poured down that and I put down paper base and I put down pebbles and then I put down dirt on top of that and a brick on top of that and the stupid thing still got in there. Right. So you've already said exactly what's going on. It's followed the same exact path. Yeah. So you need to wipe that scent from the whole path. How do I do that? I tried mothballs, but then I got yelled at. Ammonia by and I mean there are a variety of different ways you can do it. I have to breathe that. She's, she got That's, I mean, if, it, if you're having that much trouble, I would try that first. Another thing that can be done when animals get into a space that we don't want them in, play loud music, have, lo have, have bright lights during the day, like a floodlight in there underneath the stoop, things like that, um, because they're in there because it's dark during the day and quiet. Yeah, you know, that's another way to do it. Okay, thank you so much again.
You can call any time at River Trail Nature Center. You do not have to speak with me personally. We have an entire staff of people who are qualified to answer questions. I'm happy to speak with any of you, but I'm just letting you know that I'm not the only qualified person to um, speak about all of these different issues. Thanks so much for coming out tonight.